always been the fire, the refiner. Altars where you meet us. Take me there. Want for us to be Take me there. All of us are made different. All of us have different uh, ideas and ways of thinking. But God, when you it's come right in, you here, form and fashion us to be I that see, uh, that vessel and that tool that you want to use for your glory and for your kingdom. And I thank you this morning that we have a bunch of people, God, that are coming because they want to be formed and fashioned by your word. In Jesus' name, Amen. Amen. So I've been talking about seeing Jesus as he is in a, this is part four, but, but really want to, you know, the, there's so many different versions of Jesus and we all have our own, you know, in, in a way we kind of create our own version of Jesus. And I always mention that song that from the eighties uh, by Depeche Mode, your own personal Jesus, right? Do you guys remember that song? Some of you who were alive back then, your own personal, very emo song, emo band. But, but there, that's, there's a truth to that because we come to the Lord and we have this experience. But if we don't allow the word of God into our life, what happens is we, we lean on people, pastors, other people, people's opinions, right? YouTubers, whatever. And they give us an opinion. And if we're not careful, they'll give us an opinion and not the word of God. And that will shape our version of who Jesus is. Amen. So what do we want? I'm here to, to, to shape, but at the end of the day, you need to have an understanding of this so that you can check. Is he saying the right thing? Is this baloney? Oh, I don't know about that. Because, you know, there might be some parts that people come to and we don't agree upon, like, hey, are you post-trib, pre-trib, mid-trib? Hey, who cares? Whatever trib, right? I, you know, pastor used to always say, I'm on the first trip out, right? <laughs> I, I, I want to be on the first trip out. But there's a dynamic of when you get in disagreement over God, over scriptures, over ideas, it causes division. And what do you want? You don't want division. You want unity. You want agreement. So we have to find a way sometimes to work through things. And really, love is the, the centerpiece. And then as we love one another, we walk and we get in agreement. Because if you're not in agreement, then you probably, right, you need to find where you can get in agreement. Because it's the worst to come to a church, be in a church, sit in a church, and then just be disgruntled in disagreement the whole time. I mean, that's miserable. Anybody like that this morning? I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm teasing, I'm teasing. So let's go ahead and get into it. Hebrews 4.12 says this about the word. For the word that God speaks is alive and full of power, making it active, operative, energizing, and effective. It is sharper than any two-edged sword, penetrating to the dividing line of the breath of life, the soul, and the immortal spirit of joints and marrow of the deepest parts of our nature, exposing and shifting and analyzing and judging the very thoughts and purposes of the heart. This is the purpose of the word of God. We're, we're reading it here. Let's see what the passion says. I like how the passion kind of puts it in contemporary language, but I, I feel it has a little bit more of a bite to it. It says, for we have the living word of God, which is full of energy, like a two-mouthed sword. It will even penetrate the very core of our being where soul and spirit, bone and marrow meet. It interprets and reveals the true thoughts and secret motives of our hearts. There is not one person who can hide their thoughts from God, for nothing that we do remains a secret, and nothing created is concealed, but everything is exposed and defenseless before his eyes, to whom we must render an account. So the word of God's purpose isn't to come and just pat you on the back and make you feel good, even though there's times where that happens and we experience God's love. But then there's times where it comes in and it exposes the heart, where, where you're at in the secret place of your life, how you see God, how you see others, your opinions of God, his word, how you see him. And sometimes it comes in to bring a division between what's the soul, what's you, and what's God. And, we, and sometimes that experience isn't very comfortable. It's uncomfortable, especially to the flesh, because that, that word is there to crucify and burn and cut out the things that aren't God and replace them with him. 
with his power, with his spirit. So that as we go about our day, we're not walking around in deception and disgruntled and upset and mad. Right? Mad at life, depressed, weighed down, sorrow. But we're Christians, right? Shouldn't we have joy? Joy unspeakable and full of glory. Hope. Hope that says it doesn't matter what's going on around me. I'm going to be all right. I'm going to be okay. Because God is good and God's with me. It shifts from the natural, from the flesh, and it puts us in a place of, of life and love and liberty. And we should, we should have that. We should be walking that. And if we're not, then the word of God needs to come in and cut out some of the stuff that keeps us and hinders us from being all that he wants us to be. And the picture I want you to see of Jesus is Jesus isn't just this, you know, like we, we showed some pictures. Walter Solomon, he was this painter, and, and all the pictures of Jesus are just so meek and mild and sweet-mannered, right? And we all like to think, well, you know, I've been in church for, for a while, so, you know, Christians love to use, Jesus wouldn't do that. That's not very Christ-like, right? And I've said it a few times myself, the way some people have treated me. Jesus wouldn't do that. But I want to show us where Jesus actually goes in and begins to offend the mind of people and the heart to get to the matter of what's really going on in their life. Let's go to Mark 10. Now, as he was going on the road, one came running, knelt before him and asked him, good teacher, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? So Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good but one, and that is God. You know the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not murder. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Do not defraud. Honor your father and your mother. And he answered and said to him, teacher, all these things I've kept from my youth. Then Jesus, right, because that's what we, we like to do is like, I'm good. I've done everything right. But then God goes to the heart. He goes to the unseen place. Go your, he says, then Jesus looking at him, loved him, loved him. There it is. He loved him enough to get to the heart of the matter in his life. Hey, let's not just go to the surface. Let's get to the heart and let's let God expose what's really going on at that heart level. Loved him and said to him, one thing you lack, go your way, sell whatever you have and give to the poor and you will have treasures in heaven and come take up your cross and follow me. But he was sad at this word and went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. So when we come to Jesus, we're coming with our life. We're saying, God, you can have all of me. See, he came and he gave all of himself so that you could have a relationship with the Father. And when we come and we hold back, God knows. God sees. He knows the areas in our life that we're holding on to that don't glorify him, that don't bless him. And just because you're a preacher or you hold some sort of title, right, that's where that self-righteous, religious, Pharisee, and Sadducee idea comes in. That somehow we're perfect because we stand up here as ministers, and we, right? We're supposed to hold the standard and we're supposed to teach, but it doesn't mean that we're perfect. Preachers aren't perfect. People aren't perfect. But I believe in the American church, we've created this idea where we put men on pedestals and we say, well, it's like, it's like an idol where men have to be something to us or else we get offended and hurt. And if they're not that thing, then we get mad and angry and we get upset and then we leave the church we're at or, or even the relationships we're in and we get offended. And I'm showing you, I want to show you this morning that all of us, every single one of us in this room are going to come to a place in our life, an impasse, where God's going to offend your heart. You're going to get offended at the Lord because you're not going to, he's going to come in, he's going to deal with something, and you're going to have to deal with it before him. Not before men, but before him. And we see the man right here. He walks away, and he's sorrowful because Jesus pointed out the thing he loved, and it wasn't God. It was all the stuff he had. He, he loved this thing more than he loved God. Let me tell you, when you give God the thing, God will bless you with the thing that you gave him, pressed down, shaken together, and running over if it's not, right, the devil's stuff. 
God wants to bless you with his stuff. And sometimes the devil's got a hook in our jaw and he wants to break it off of our life so that we can live for him and fully embrace what he has for us. Amen. He's, he's faithful to do that. He does that at every level, every, every life. None of us get to run from this thing called Christ, our relationship with God. And there's times where God's not, he's going to be in disagreement with you. Right? Does, haven't you ever felt that before? Sometimes when you're praying and, and God just kind of, he's dealing with something. You're like, well, I just don't agree with that, God. And he's like, well, pff, you can go ahead and disagree all day long. I can guarantee you, you're going to change before he does. <laughs> and if not, you're going to be miserable. He says, I don't change. He says, I change not. He's holy. He, he's to be reverenced and to be feared and to be loved and to be worshipped from that place. He's not just this half-hearted, ah, Jesus. He's a cool Jesus. He dresses hip. He wears sunglasses. He walks in the room and he's like, hey, everybody, I'm the cool Jesus. I want to hang out with the cool Jesus. He's so cool. And now we have a Christianity that tries to make Jesus cool to people to get him into church. That's not what I see in the Bible. I see Jesus as he is. And you see people who come to him and the fire of who he is either burns out the dross or it causes them to run from him because they don't want to let go of what they have. In Matthew 16, or wait, did I? Yeah, I'm at 15. Uh, 15, 21. Then Jesus went out from there and departed to the region of Tyre and Sidon. And behold, a woman, a Canaan, came from the region and cried out to him, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. My daughter is severely demon-possessed. So she's in this place where she's heard about Jesus and his power and his ability to cast out demons and, and to bring healing. But he ignores her. He answers her not a word. He ignores her. Well, that's pretty offensive, right? Jesus, didn't you hear what I said? Jesus, hello? Just ignores her. <sighs> How could he ignore me? I'm out of here. I'm leaving. No. But he answered, and then, uh, wait, hold on, sorry. But he answered, not in our word. And his disciples came and urged him, saying, send her away, for she cries out after us. She's annoying. Go, send her away, because she didn't leave. But he answered and said, I was not sent except to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Then she came and worshiped him, saying, Lord, help me. Desperate. Desperation. I'm not leaving because you're God. You're the creator of all things in the universe. I'm not going to leave because you have the power to change my situation. And I'm not going to let offense and bitterness and strife come into my life and keep me from you. Because I know that you're who you say you are. And then he answered, is it not good to take the children's bread and throw it to little dogs? And she said, yes, Lord. Yet even the little dogs eat the crumbs which fall from the master's table. And in that moment, I, I feel like that was a, right? Because this is what I, how I see God, right? God loves the interaction with his people. And we think it's got to be all religious and like, you know, the like services that you see that everybody's dressed all weird and they do all these like religious things to try to. That's not what God looks like. God's very much in tune with and in, in involved in our life at a much deeper level than just all the stuff that we see on the outside that make people think that they're religious or, you know, he goes he goes beyond that. And I see him like in this place where he offends her. And then she drops the mic on him like, yeah, but even the dogs, but I pop, right? And he, <laughs> it's like a drop the mic moment at God. And God goes, oh, I like that. I haven't seen such this kind of faith in all of Israel. And then Jesus answered, says, oh, woman, great is your faith. Let it be as you desire. And her daughter was healed that very hour. So you see in exchange here of somebody wanting something from God and desiring God to do something and God offending them. 
And then their response wasn't, I'm going to take on the offense and get hurt and mad. It was, I'm going to press in and push past this because I know God's got something for me. You know, you can actually spontaneously worship God. It doesn't have to be on a Sunday when the time's 10, 1030, we're going to start songs, and that's when we worship. You can just be out your, throughout your day, maybe you're driving in the car, and all of a sudden you go, you know what, I'm going to worship God right now. Hallelujah, I am not alone, right? You can, you can be anywhere at any time. Even the guy cutting you off on the road. And you're like, hallelujah. And then he, and you're wanting to, ah. But instead you're like, who cares? Hallelujah. <laughs> right? It's better to be in that place than just be all grumpy because I'm sure the flesh is going to respond instead of the spirit. But we can worship God throughout our day and how we live. And we can see a friend at work and, and see them kind of down. And we're all happy, right? We're like, we're, we're living with God. And then somebody's sad and why are you sad? What's going on? And they open up and they say, well, this happened, that. Well, let me tell you something. We got something to give. But see, when we're all down and we're just thinking about us and our hurts and our pain, it makes us real selfish. It's about me. It's about my feelings. And instead of looking, what's the need? What's the need in other people's lives around me? See, that's the, how God flows through us is he flows through us to others. And we need to become a vessel for him. We were talking about this at the men's gathering. You know, we're all containers. We're containers. You can be full of the world and the devil, and he can get so a hold of your mind and your thought life and how you think that you're depressed and you're sad and you're miserable every day of your life because he's, he's the one you're filling your life with. But when you turn to the Lord, that's why we need to be baptized in the Holy Spirit, because he comes to contain us and be full of life and begin. What we have to do is begin to yield to him and let him have his way. See, the enemy gets us to get to yield to him and then he has our way or his way and we sin and we get right bitterness. And there's people out there now in the world that are murdering and killing and destroying and talking all kinds of hateful things. You see all kinds of hateful stuff on social media. It's insane. It makes you think you're living in in the last days. That's what it looks like out there. Like this thing's coming to an end pretty soon. Amen. We want to draw close to the Lord, and when we draw close to him, we have to recognize he's holy. So as you approach something that's holy, the holiness in him begins to expose all the unholiness in us. But it's not to shame you. It's not to make you feel like you're some dirty rat and you need to grovel on the floor and get on the floor and, oh, God, I'm so miserable, right? No, you, you bow and you yield and you say, you're holy. You're holy. And he comes and he picks us up and he says, and you're holy too. And he fills us with his spirit and he gives us his word. So as we're walking around in our daily life, he begins to give us promptings. He begins to speak to, to us on the inside and say, you know how that made you mad? You know how this over here? Don't look at that. Look at me. Forgive, yield, surrender. Let me have my way in your life. You see those things that, you're, that you possess and you think you have all this great stuff? I want you to let it go. You know, I have a cousin who was radically saved. And let me tell you, when he got saved, he got saved. And he was radical. And he had an ear to hear that there were certain type of preachers, right? And he would, he would find these men who were just radical, who would preach fire. And it was like life-changing. It caused you to want to give your life everything and just go after God because they preached a message that was raw. And it was by the Holy Spirit. Not some boring preacher who's just trying to give you information and tell you Bible stories. In fact, your life is not to just sit around to listen to Bible stories. It's so that you would actually be one. That you would actually have a story to tell, a testimony. That God would so do something in your life that you would be a living testimony. You walk around telling people about the goodness of God and who he is in your life. Not going around complaining about this person and that person and I mean, that's, that's a true sign of somebody who's immature and hasn't grown in the things of God. Because the words of our lips shouldn't be complaints and whining and, uh, 
It should be praise and blessing and prophecy, words of knowledge, breaking off the yokes of the in- what the enemies put on people, the chains and the bondage. People who are depressed usually are thinking bad about themselves. So we come in and we speak life. No, you're good. You're, you're more than a conqueror. God's got great plans for you. Don't look at your problem. Look at him. He's the solution. And sometimes that takes the individual coming to God and start making changes in their life. Start changing the things you're doing that got you in there in the first place. And God will help you. He'll get in agreement with you. Amen. Matthew 16. Then Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what profit is is it to a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? For the Son of Man will come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then he will reward each one according to his works. You know, I have such a passion you know, you're not going to go into most churches and hear a message like this, okay? And I'm not trying to make myself like, I'm just some great guy who's going to preach this message, blah, 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 right? But I'm telling you the truth because I've gone to many churches and I've listened to many preachers and you never hear this stuff. But it's in the Bible and it needs to be preached because it goes to the core of who we are and it starts to deal with that issue of self and me and my, right? Deny self. Pick up your cross, It's to go all in for him and his purpose and his calling. And there's a version of Christianity that doesn't teach you these things. It teaches you that Jesus just comes and it's all about you. And he wants to give you everything that you need and you need and you, 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 you. And it never demands us to have to go in and start looking at the heart level and going, man, where's my, I have a stinking attitude right now. And I need to address it. It's me. It's it's my stinking fault. Right? It's me. It's my fault. I got to change. Most people, they don't live in that that place. They look around and it's everybody else's fault. It's your fault. It's your fault. It's my mom's fault. And I've said said this stuff before. But I want to stir us up. I'm not here to try to like, you know, I'm not puffed up trying to be like, I'm just this, you know, I need this in my life. Because there's times where God challenges me and I have to die to myself and I have to be able to recognize it because other people can come in and say stuff and sometimes it's not God, but then there's times where they say stuff and it's God and it rubs me the wrong way and just because you get mad doesn't mean that's not God working on you. Well, God wouldn't make me mad. I don't know what God you're serving then. Because there's times God has challenged me and had to make me get on my face and go, God, why? Right? Oh, rah. And there's been times where, you know, my unsafe self comes out. God, what the woo? Right? And I don't think God's up there going, oh, how dare you? How dare you say that to me? No, he knows. He loves us just the way we are, but he's not going to shift. In fact, He's going to stand strong and still, and then he's going to want us to shift. That's why God puts authority and structure in place. He doesn't put it in place so that we can try to undermine it, try to fight it, right? Because that's what the devil did. The devil actually looked to his authority and rebelled and got mad and bitter. And eh, I'm going to do my thing. I'm going to exalt myself above God. I'm going to be this. I'm going to be that. That's the devil's spirit working in people. But God's spirit brings people to a place of surrender and trust him, trusting him, serving him. It's all about him. And I know that he's just and he's faithful. And if anybody messes with me, they're messing with God. And God's the one who can spank them better than I can. So I'm going to trust him with my life. But see, that's why we have you know, all this stuff happening in the world today with Israel and in Palestine, and you see this fight, and, and there is some just twisted stuff out there right now, just totally deceiving people and trying to erase the whole thing that happened before it started. Then you got people creating, you know, conspiracies. Oh, they're lying. They're not. T- so you don't even know what to believe. And at the end of the day, it's like, I don't care. I'm going to trust God and that his 
who he is and what he is is going to be seen on the earth because there's going to be believers that stand up to represent him. And I'm going to pray for Israel because that's what the Bible says. Because the Bible says many things about Israel and that they're his chosen people. So I'm going to get in alignment with God and trust him. And I know they're not going into Gaza and killing everybody. That's what they did to them. And now it's like, oh, now, now Israel's the enemy. It's like, whatever. There's my little Israel-Gaza thing for this sermon, okay? <laughs> I got to say one thing every time. Because it is important for us to, to, to see the uh, affairs of life and understand. Like Jesus said, can you see the weather and you see things are happening? You know there's a storm coming. So it's important for the church to engage, right? Because there are preachers that say, you know what? Politics isn't for the church. Polit keep politics out of Christianity. Yeah, and that's why you have in America, in the state that it's in, because you have a bunch of Christians who are just coming to their bubble and just going, me, me, feed me, 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 me. Instead of coming and saying, God, change me, mold me, make me a warrior, make me a champion, make me a, a mighty man and woman of God. I want to do great things for you, God. I want to see the earth and the fullness of, of your glory flood the earth. I want to go into institutions and see the power of God sweep through that place. I want to see people uh, yielded and surrendered and weeping and crying out for God and his, his righteousness and his glory to fill the earth. How does that happen? It happens because there's people that get full of him and they go out into the darkness and they start being a light and they start being a lamp and they preach his word. They preach the truth. No matter if people throw rocks at them, no matter if somebody comes for their head, they're going to stand and they're going to proclaim the truth. This, to me, is Christianity. It's not a cool church that I go to with cool music and a hip children's department that looks like Chick-fil-A when you drive up because you want to attract all the young families. Oh, wow, that church has like a Chick-fil-A playground. It's like, come on, that's church? Church, it's much more than that. It's, it's about being radical. And we, we got people dumbed down and numb to reality. They're numb. They've just been filled all this cotton candy and cookies and cookies. But sometimes we got to eat something that challenges us so that we can become who God wants us to be. Go back and study all the men of the Bible. You're going to see a very challenging road they went down. Look at Moses. Look at any of them, but see their passion is the thing that pr pushed them through the challenges and it made them who they were so that they could be even greater in what God had called them to do. We don't run from opposition and challenge. We embrace it just like Jesus did. Jesus embraced. He knew that's why when he was at the garden of Gethsemane and he's sweating drops of blood because he's like, I'm going to literally die on purpose. He is the perfect example of what it means to die to self. If it not my will, but yours be done. And what was God's will? That he would go to a cross and suffer greatly. His flesh was beaten. Crown of thorns. Have you seen what that thing looks like? Those thorns shoved on his head. And then we got a Christianity that gets mad and offended and wants to leave this church and go to the next church and do this. And that's baby Christianity. And I'm sorry that that's just not who I am, nor who do I want to be. I want to see believers that are passionate and want to run after God with all their heart. And there's going to be times where, yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, I didn't mean to hurt your feelings. I'm sorry if I said something wrong. Let's get down to the disagreement of what it is and let's figure out how do we move forward. But let's just sit there and cry and cry about it and whine about it and go tell this person about it, that person about it. Oh, and now I need counseling. I got to go see a counselor so they can pat, pamper me. Come on, take it like Jesus did on the cross. Embraced it. and pow, pow. He was whipped. With the, what is it? The cat of nine tails it had all those little pieces of, was it glass or clay or whatever? Ripped his back out. Blood everywhere. Come on. And then we want to get mad and offended because somebody didn't look at us the right way or didn't say hi to us or sat in our seat. Come on. God wants to call us to greater.
you and I can be strong believers who are strong in spirit, but also strong in love. And just like Jesus loved him, but then he told them the truth, and the truth made him sad. So just because God's working in your life doesn't mean, well, if Jesus does it, then it's always going to feel good and it's not going to hurt. Well, if it's Jesus, then it's always going to make me happy and it's going to make me glad and I'm just going to go around dancing around. No, sometimes Jesus comes in and he messes with the very thing that's the idol or the thing in our life that he's wanting to rip out of our life. And sometimes you're going to feel sad about it and you're going to feel pain but it's okay because if you let that pain have its perfect work in you, it's going to produce something righteous and full of power in your life, right? If there's no pain, then there's no gain. Anybody who's had to get anything in life has had to go through a fight. God calls us to stand with him. Amen. Thank you, Lord. In Matthew 10, verse 34, do not think that I came to bring peace on the earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father. This is Jesus talking, by the way. This is, this is, G, this is red letters. Against his father, a daughter against her mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and a man's enemies will be those of his own household. He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he does not take up his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. He who finds his life will lose it. And he who loses his life for my sake will find it. He who receives you receives me. And he who receives me receives him who sent me. He who receives a prophet in the name of a prophet shall receive a prophet's reward. And he who receives a righteous man in the name of a righteous man shall receive a righteous man's reward. And whoever gives one of these little ones only a cup of water in the name of a disciple, assuredly I say to you, he shall by no means lose his reward. God has rewards for you and I, for those who stand the test of time, who embrace the challenge And stand strong and let God do the work on the inside of them. There are rewards for us. And people go around saying, oh, I don't have to do anything. Jesus paid it all right. Jesus paid all to him I owe. Right? And then they live their life like they don't owe them anything. They do what they want, when they want, how they want. They walk around with their bad attitudes and how they want to do it. And no one ever can tell them no and correct them or rebuke them. If you dare rebuke them, then you're going to pay for it. And, and church is some of the worst. I feel sorry for some pastors because they have to correct people. And those people try to rip their whole church apart, go around gossiping, causing division. And just two weeks before, they're like, we love you. We're here for you. We'll do whatever you want. We love you, pastor. Thank you. Two weeks later. Blah, 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 blah. But see, if you're in Christ... You're in it for the right reasons, and you're not trying to get the applause of men. The applause of men, let me tell you, they won't last you very long. In fact, you got to do something great the next time to get their applause again. But you want God's applause. You want him saying, well done, good and faithful servant. And this thing of him bringing a sword, you know, God's not confused, right? He's not like, watch out for division, but I'm going to cause division. What he's saying is that he's going, again, it's about the heart. When you put other people in your life ahead of God, he sees it. When you worship men or worship a relationship more than you do God, God sees that. And sometimes he has a way of getting in and causing, right, something to happen to cause there to be a division that comes in for you to make a choice. Are you going to serve God or are you going to? go your way and be sorry, right? Well, I'd rather have this relationship that's not right for me. And I know God, you know, would want me to break up with this boyfriend or girlfriend, but you know what? I really like them and they're mine, but God's been dealing with your heart and you're ignoring him. And so sometimes he turns the heat up and sometimes this friction comes because he's wanting to show you, hey, you're either going to be in this for the right reasons or you're going to be in it for the wrong reasons and it's going to cost you in some way. 
And I'd rather my life, I'd rather it cost me something for him than cost me something for the world. And this is something that I'm still wrestling with in my life where you get into a place where God's dealing with you and you're trying to move in a direction and you're like, God, and he's like, I'm not going to shift. You better obey. You better do what I'm saying. And you're like, but I don't want to. (laughs) I don't want to do it. Well, it's okay because God just accepts me for who I am. Yeah, he'll let you just, he'll leave you alone and find somebody else who's saying, I'll go all the way. Because God will pick people. He put, puts his hand on them. He puts their anoint, his anointing on them. And he says, hey, I want to use your life. And they go, ah, I'm too busy, God. I got better things to do. Let's go to Matthew 21, and we'll close with this. Here another parable. There was a certain landowner who planted a vineyard and set a hedge around it, dug a wine press in it, and built a tower. And he leased it to vine dressers and went into a far country. Now, when vintage time drew near, he sent his servants to the vine dressers that they might receive its fruit. And the vine tr- dressers took his servants, beat one, killed one, and stoned another. Again, he sent other servants, more than the first, and they did likewise to them. Then, last of all, he sent his son to them, saying, They will respect my son. But when the vine dressers saw the son, they said among themselves, This is the, ha- the heir. Come, let us kill him and seize his inheritance. So they took him and cast him out of the vineyard and killed him. Therefore, when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those vine dressers? They said to him, he will destroy those wicked men miserably and lease his vineyard to one to, to other vine dressers who will render to him the fruits in their seasons. And Jesus said to them, Have you never read the scriptures? The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore, I say to you, the kingdom of God will be taken from you and given to a nation bearing the fruits of it. And whoever falls on the stone will be broken, but whomever it falls, it will grind him to powder. Now, when the chief priests and Pharisees heard his parable, they perceived that he was speaking of them. But when they sought to lay hands on him, they feared the multitudes because they took him as a prophet. We have to fall and break before the Lord, not let God and his his righteousness and who he is, because we're stubborn, come and crush us. And there will be many people. The Bible says there'll be weeping and gnashing in teeth in the last days, because there will there will be people who will just be so hard and rebellious to God. And they will grind their teeth in rage and anger. As in his return, not everybody when Jesus shows up is going to be like, oh, Lord, I'm so happy. There are going to be those that are going to be so angry and mad because the the thing that's on the inside of them is going to be exposed. That wickedness, that evil, that thing they love more than God. God wants to purify our hearts. He wants to purify our minds so that our vessels can be pure and holy because he'll use those vessels. He'll use you in great and mighty ways in your life. So you might look at your life and say, well, I never really felt called or like I was that important to God. You know, I just wanted to do this and make money and live comfortably. But see, that's not what the spirit of God does. He doesn't come in and say, hey, I know you want to live comfortably. Okay, that's cool. You do you. I'm going to go over here and find somebody who's a drug addict, who's busted, who's miserable, and then I'm going to put my hand on them and raise them up and use them mightily. Why does that happen? That's because the person over here is at the end of their rope. Like, I'm desperate. God, do something in my life when the person over here is just comfortable living the way they're living, and they're okay with it, and there's no desperation. There's no cry in their life because they have a comfort zone. And God doesn't force himself on you, even though at the end, everybody's going to get forced in some direction because he's coming back and he's coming with fire in his eyes. Right? It's not like at the end, he's just going to be like, okay, everybody who didn't want to serve me, it's okay, see ya. But the people who did, 
No, God, he sees and he knows. He knows the secrets. He knows the hidden things. He knows all the stuff we're hiding, all the things we don't want to say, tell people. God knows all that stuff. You're not hiding anything from him. We're not hiding. I'm not hiding anything from him. He knows everything. He knows every moment of my life. And that, that brings a certain, oh, gosh, you mean, God, you're watching me in those embarrassing moments of my life? Yep, I can see it all. It kind of makes you go, oh, Lord, help me. <laughs> right? Have you ever heard the saying, when you get to heaven, they're going to have like a, a movie screen, and you're going to see your whole life? And it's like, please, just do some editing, because there's some things I don't want <laughs> to be played on the movie screen. <laughs> Has anybody heard that before? Well, guess what? It's happening. You're going to have a movie of your life. You're going to see it at the end. No, I'm just kidding. Who knows? Maybe that happens. Maybe it doesn't. But God is so awesome. He loves you. And even in your, even in your, uh, your apathy or your, you know, wanting to be comfortable. And he loved that young man. But he, he let the young man go his way. He let him leave. Did he? No, wait, young man, I changed my mind. Come back, young man. Wait, you're going to leave me? No. Come back. Please. No, he didn't do that. He let him go his way. But see, God is wanting those who are serious about it with him. All right? Not, I hope people don't come here because they're trying to make me happy and do things for me. Man, you're here because God wants you here. You're planted in this house because this is where God had led you to put your roots down so that he can do some shaping and forming in your life. It's not because I'm perfect or I'm great. It's because he's great and he's awesome. And he, there might be a season where he moves you in another place because I, I've been under four ma major pastors in my life that have been in my life and they shaped and they formed me and they've given me a perspective of God because everyone carries a little bit of, of God. And some of us carry a little bit more, but let me tell you, there's no end of how much God you can carry if you'll just l give him room to do it in your life. And I know this message isn't the popular type of message. It's not the feel, you know, goosebump pimples, everybody's crying at the end of the service type of message. But I, I really want to, because this is who I, I in my life am and who I want to be. I want to burn with fire. There's an old uh, Pentecostal preacher who said, dip me in the kerosene of your spirit. And light me on fire so others can watch me burn. There's something about being sold out and passionate for God that is attractive to those who are lost and dying. But see, this cool Christianity, this hip Christianity that we have today, it's not going to do very much. It just gather a bunch of people who say, I know God. I want to gather a bunch of people who say, I want to do something for God. Because at the end of our lives, all of us, we're going to stand before him and he's going to hold us account for how we lived. And I just pray this morning that, God, you would baptize people in your spirit. God, I pray, God, that, that mind, those mindsets would shift. God, that you would open their eyes. They would see you in a new way. And, God, that there would be a desperate cry in their heart that says, God, I'm all in. I want everything you have for my life. Because I'm not just living for this life. This life goes by like that. And I'm sure we can ask some of our seniors in this room, if we go, hey, how, how fast did it go by? Man, pff, right? It went by really quick. I remember when I was 35. I remember when I was doing this, the jitterbug, you know? I was out there on the dance floor. And now I can't even jitterbug because my legs hurt. <laughs> Right? Because it goes by like that. And there's a generation who's looking for purpose. All these people protesting, they, they have no skin in the game. They got no idea what they're talking about, and they're out there protesting. Why? Because people are born to live on purpose. We're born to live for something. And there's people out there who will just live for hell and the devil with all their heart and passion because they don't know the truth of who God is. And he's calling and beckoning them, come live for me. Not only will I save and redeem you, but I'll fill you with my spirit and I'll set you ablaze and you'll do great things for me. And all those things we do for him are the things we take into eternity. None of the foolishness these people are fighting for, 
They don't take, none of that is going to earn rewards in heaven. That's all going to be burnt up with fire. And it's going to be ash and it's going to mean nothing. But what we do for God and when we preach the gospel, it's like precious jewels. They're jewels that stand the heat, withstand the heat of testing in our life. Our faith, our ability to hang on to God with all our might. And let me tell you, he hangs on to you that way. Even more so. Sometimes we're like, I'm hanging on to God. He's like, don't worry, I got you. I'm doing all I can, God. Don't worry, I got you. See, but it's, it's the cry. It's the, it's the heart he wants. He wants us. You know how it tickles God for somebody to say, God, I'm hanging on to you, Lord. And he's like, uh, no, I'm actually hanging on to you, but I like the passion. I like the cry of your heart. It brings pleasure to me. Your faith pleases me. Amen. But we got we to gotta close. Father, I thank you for this service. We're going to have an awesome festival. And I encourage us to get to know one another and to open up our lives and, you know, encourage one another. I pray God would even move after the service. If you feel anything, lay on your heart. God says this. God says to do that. Do it. Be faithful. Be obedient to what God is speaking to you. I want to see a, a city and a, a church on fire. I want to see people excited about God excited about what he wants to do with their life. Father, I pray this morning, with all, uh, if you would bow your heads and close your eyes, I just want you to raise your hand to God and say, God, set me ablaze. And if you've been on fire before and your fire's gone out and you feel like, you know what, I'm just not as hot as I used to be, then just raise your hand and say, God, here's my wick. Light me on, light me on fire. Here's my wick, God. Light me ablaze. Set me ablaze for your purpose. Shape me, mold me, change me, move me. Whatever you want to do. Rip out the stuff in my life that's not supposed to be there. Rip out those opinions and, and the offenses and the hurts in my life. Rip them out of my life, God, so that I can worship you freely. I don't have the weight of pain and bitterness and anger in my life, but God, rip it out. Set me ablaze. Help me to love those who persecute me. Help me to love and walk with those who aren't like me. Help me to serve and bless them. Help me to show them who you really are. Jesus. Amen. Take whatever you, you take whatever you